My name is Eva Galperin. I'm the director of cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I am also the head of EFF's Threat Lab, uh, and I do security research. Me and my team do security research that focuses on the privacy and security needs of extremely vulnerable populations, like journalists, activists, uh, and people in uh, domestic abuse situations. Different vulnerable populations have different concerns. Um, a lot of the populations that I, uh, that I work with and that I'm particularly concerned about are worried about government surveillance from governments with varying levels of, uh, of uh, surveillance capability, uh, are worried about police surveillance, again, from various police departments with different capabilities, um, or sometimes uh, surveillance by their, uh, by their loved ones and their families and people who know them very well and have a lot of access. Uh, so right now, I've just spent the last year and a half working on a project involving the uh, eradication of spouseware and stalkerware, which is uh, software which is targeted at, uh, or which is uh, commercial software which is sold to, uh, to people for the purpose of spying on, um, on their partners and is frequently used in cases of domestic abuse. I ended up in a, in a situation where I discovered that some, uh, someone who was doing security research with me uh, was engaged in uh, a long campaign of abusing women. And one of the things that, uh, that one of the women said was that she didn't come forward for such a long time because she was scared, because he was a hacker and he had threatened to compromise her devices. And I was so angry that uh, I wanted to make sure that people wouldn't feel that way again. Uh, certainly the problem of, uh, of domestic abuse and stalking and harassment is not new at all. Uh, the use of uh, sort of uh, digital devices in uh, stalking and harassment is also not new. Uh, spouseware has been available for you know, uh, desktop machines for many years. Um, but a couple of things are new. The first is uh, the ubiquity of, uh, of Internet of Things devices, and the other is the ubiquity of smartphones. So we're all carrying tracking devices around in our pockets that also contain all of our text messages, our pictures, our email, our uh, login credentials, and uh, our calendars. And that's incredibly revealing. Essentially, the contents of your phone are the next best thing to having the contents of your brain. So, uh, right now, uh, I, I did a review of how many of the you know, big uh, antivirus companies are actually finding this spouseware and marking it as malicious. And the answer is, not a lot. Uh, we're usually seeing something like results of, you know, 10 to 20 out of 60 recognizing, you know, kind of the top samples of spouseware out there. Uh, but one of the cool things that uh, happened last week is that Kaspersky announced that uh, they're going to start taking uh, spouseware much more seriously. And they are not only going to recognize uh, spouseware, but they're going to specifically uh, mark it as malicious. So one of the things that I hear very often uh, when I tell people that Kaspersky is doing this is, well, what if I don't trust Kaspersky? Uh, what if I don't want to install Kaspersky's products on my devices? And my answer to that is uh, I would really like to see the rest of the antivirus industry step up and turn this into a practice that everybody follows so that I can recommend their products. I am not normally a tremendous fan of regulation, but I think that there are, is a uh, there is a place in uh, in sort of government and law enforcement right now for taking a very close look at the companies that are making this spouseware and uh, reviewing the laws they may or may not be violating. Uh, the next things that I'm going to do are definitely uh, putting some pressure on the other AV companies to catch up. So that's uh, really the first step. Um, I also have a couple of, uh, of asks for Google, including a uh, sort of review of the apps in the Google Play Store. And I have a sort of pie-in-the-sky ask for Apple to see whether or not they can make a, uh, a notice that comes up making it impossible to covertly jailbreak a phone. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about. There's, there's a lot for everybody to do. My advice for aspiring young security researchers is to look where no one else is looking. Uh, uh, when everyone is looking at supply chain attacks or China 
or Russia or Iran, uh, there are a lot of eyes on the problem. And uh, a lot of the most interesting research that I have ever done has been uh, focused on looking where no one else thinks is worthwhile. So Syria, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, Lebanon, looking at you know, women in domestic abuse situations, LBGTQ populations, um, and you can make a really big impact without having to be uh, particularly technical this way, uh, because a lot of the very, very technical people will think that this work is beneath them, and so it just doesn't get done. I have, this is my second trip to SAS. So I went last year, I went to Cancun. This is actually a very different conference. I, uh, I enjoyed Cancun very much, uh, but one of the things that I really enjoy about uh, SAS in Singapore is uh, that it's uh, a little bit more laid back and uh, a little bit more so uh, sober, which makes it uh, easier to have conversations uh, about work, which I really appreciate.